So far in this series on the three paths to God, I described about the path of karma and the path of jnana and told you that both of them are dependent on the path of bhakti. Neither one is complete because both the karmi and the jnani have to surrender to God in order to attain their ultimate goal, which is the same for every soul, ultimate bliss of God and liberation from maya. So to attain either of those or both of those, everybody must do bhakti. Now, after looking in detail at the path of karma and the path of jnana, Yesterday I started telling you about the path of bhakti. And we learned that bhakti is actually a divine power of God. The bhakti which is sought after by all of the paramahansas, the jnanis and yogis, it's a divine power of God which is God's innermost, most private power, the topmost power in the divine world, which even keeps God under its control. Naraji described about this divine bhakti called Siddha Bhakti in his Narad Bhakti Darshan. He said, Anirvachaniyam prema swarupam. He said it's Anirvachaniya. It can't be described. That divine power, that cannot be described. Nonetheless, he did tell us something. He said, Amrita Swarupacha, that divine bhakti or divine prem, it is the form of God himself. It's not separate from God. And it lasts forever. So once you attain that divine bhakti, you remain in that divine state forever. It's Amrit. He also said, 
यल्लब्ध्वा उमान सिद्धो भवती अमृतो भवती तृप्तो भवती the vyakya of each of these sutras is very long i'm just giving you in gist what did he tell us about someone who attains that divine bhakti he said they become sidd they become amrit they become tript sidd means perfect but it means like uh, you know how when you're cooking rice you don't want it to be undercooked so there's some little hard bit left in the middle you don't want it to be overcooked so it becomes like halwa you want it just in between so each individual piece of rice is perfectly well cooked soft but still existing individually so narad ji is saying that the soul who attains divine love he's like that he no longer has the kankar that hard bit of maya inside of him that part is eliminated but he hasn't just lost his identity like when you overcook the rice that's like a soul who merges into formless god and gets liberation his apparent identity is lost so he doesn't that doesn't happen to him so he's perfectly well cooked it means he's free from maya he attains god but he maintains his individuality siddho bhavati amrito bhavati again it means that uh, prem that bhakti is amrit it never finishes it goes on forever so the bhakt becomes like that he also becomes the form of divine love tripto bhavati tripti means satisfaction but the interesting thing about the tripti that you get when you attain that divine power of god there's pyas with the tripti you're perfectly satisfied yet you desire more and that's why narad ji says pratikshana vardhamanam it goes on increasing it's like you know how the moon increases and when it gets to the full moon then it starts decreasing that's like the happiness of this world it reaches a peak and then it levels off and then it starts decreasing <laughs> but prem never has a purnima that divine bhakti of god you just go on enjoying it and it goes on increasing it never reaches the point where it stops and becomes static so you keep enjoying yet you can keep desiring for more and experiencing more and more and more so it's a divine kind of tripti yet प्राप्य न किंचिद्वांछति न शोचति न द्वेष्टि न रमते नोत्साही भवति नारद जी सज द वन हु अटेन्स दैट डिवाइन भक्ति ही नेवर डिजायर्स फॉर एनीथिंग एवर अगेन बिकॉज ही इज पूर्ण काम ऑल ऑफ हिज डिजायर्स हैव बीन फुलफिल्ड बिकॉज ही गॉट द अल्टीमेट थिंग once you're enjoying ultimate happiness what's left to desire and <laughs> just go on enjoying so he has no desire left na shochati he never grieves for anything ever again na dvaishti he never feels enmity or hatred towards anyone ever again na ramate the enjoyments of this world there of no interest to him because it's like uh, a millionaire seeing a penny on the ground would he stoop to pick it up it's of no value to him no tsahi bhavati he doesn't worry about what he's going to attain or not attain in the world so he takes things as they come tat prapya tadeva avalokayati tadeva shrinoti tadeva bhashayati tadeva chintayati the one who has attained that divine bhakti he just sees everywhere his beloved form of god he sees prem everywhere tadeva lokayati he sees tadeva shrinoti that's all he hears tadeva bhashayati that's all he speaks 
Tadeva chintayati. That's all he can think. So he attains that divine state if he attains divine bhakti. But I explained to you yesterday that that divine bhakti is not attained through any practice, but rather there's another kind of bhakti, the bhakti that we have to do. And by doing that bhakti, we don't attain the divine bhakti but we become qualified to receive it. The bhakti we have to do is very similar to love in this world or attachment in this world. How does that work? You think positively about someone in an affectionate way and that builds an attachment in your mind. It's a very simple process. It doesn't happen on its own. There's no such thing as love at first sight. Attraction at first sight, yes. But love takes time. You have to build up an attachment. An attachment re requires repeated thinking in a positive way about that person or even about a thing. You can start desiring a thing if you think enough times about it. The more times you think about it, the more attached you get to it and the more, the bigger that desire becomes and the more the desire keeps returning into your mind. So this same process of the mind is used for bhakti to God. You think about God positively, you visualize his form, think about his divine beauty, think about what it would be like to meet him in person. We'll talk more about all of these details in the days to come. But this is the bhakti we do where we just think of God in an affectionate way, as we would think of someone that we're related to in this world. So that's called sadhana bhakti. And by bringing God into our mind in that way, we're purifying our heart. So sadhana bhakti purifies the heart. And the means is very simple, as I said, just bring God into your heart. Keep thinking about Him. By doing sadhana bhakti, we purify our heart or our mind, antahakaran, whatever you want to think of it. When it's fully pure, then we receive the divine bhakti. So that divine bhakti is a gift from God, very simple. But it's only given into a heart which has been purified by doing sadhana bhakti. So we can't just say, okay God, you grace with the divine bhakti, then grace me. I'm not doing anything. I don't even have to do bhakti, no devotion, no sadhana. So God says, no, you have to do sadhana to purify your heart. Then I can give you that bhakti. And one other thing is that that bhakti is given through a God-realized saint. That's another key. Remember I told you when Sri Krishna wanted to grace Uddhav with that divine Prem, he sent him to the gopis. So when great jnanis themselves need to receive that divine bhakti through the grace of a living rasic saint, then the same must be true for us. Those jnanis, as long as they're on the earth planet, they have a chance before they leave their body and merge into formless God, if they ever meet a true rasic saint. Rasic means the one who has experienced that divine bhakti and has attained it. So such a rasic saint can grace a jnani saint with bhakti immediately because their heart is already pure. And they can grace us with bhakti once our heart becomes purified. This is something that's really important to understand that that prem dan, it's called, when the God-realized saint in possession of bhakti gives that or passes that on to his disciple who has fully surrendered and has fully purified his heart. That is the true guru-disciple relationship. You see, <clears throat> nowadays 
a lot of people go and get mantras from gurus. But originally, what was, why was that mantra given? Saints did give mantras to their disciples, but you know when they gave it? They gave it when that disciple was fully ready to receive God realization. So along with the mantra, there was power. So when that disciple received the mantra from the guru, he became God realized that instant. It's like you're building a house. And when you build the house, you do all the wiring and put all the fittings and everything and you get it ready. And when all of that is set, all the bulbs and switches are in place, then you connect the main wire from the telephone pole to your house and everything lights up instantly. Well, not quite instantly. It take, electricity travels at the speed of light, right? So there's some delay. Now, when a, when a true disciple's heart is fully purified, the guru gives that instantly. There's no delay. It happens instantly. But the disciple has to be ready. So this uh, idea of going to a guru and getting a mantra. So if the guru is really giving a mantra, shouldn't we feel something? You know, I'm taking you back to olden times when the guru gave the mantra. That was the moment of God realization for that soul. So. It means that there should be some internal change when we receive that, right? However, we receive it and we feel the same. So someone may say that, well, you weren't qualified to receive that mantra. That's why. Well, well then why did he give it to me? A true saint can know is someone qualified or not. He's not ignorant like we are. So this is the true moment of God realization. To get to that point, we have to do sadhana bhakti. When our sadhana bhakti, see sadhana bhakti goes, as your heart purifies, you enter into bhav bhakti. Bhav bhakti means when your heart has purified to some degree, you start to really experience the closeness of God. Yatha yathatma parimrijyate sau mat punya gatha shravana bhidhanai tatha tatha vidadhatu tatha tatha chak Bhagavatam says that the more your heart purifies by practicing sadhana, the more real your experience of God's closeness becomes. Let's say someone's worshipping Krishna. So they're meditating on Krishna in their mind. That meditation is not imagination because Krishna is omnipresent so he's right there before you but that becomes more that realization becomes more and more intense so when that feeling really starts to hit you that Krishna is right here and when you visualize him in your meditation it feels real and you you get kind of a an inner feeling that goes with it that feeling is called bhav so that also is granted by the Guru. When someone's practicing sadhana bhakti with the guidance and grace of a true God-realized saint, that saint is able to grace the disciple with that bhao. So that goes on purifying the heart right up to complete heart purification. And then the instant the disciple's heart is fully purified, then the Guru grants that divine bhakti. First, in fact, he makes the, the disciple's heart divine by giving him swarup shakti. That makes your whole senses, mind and intellect divine. Then into your divine mind, he gives you divine bhakti. So that's the process of God realization. So again, we come back to the point that, you know, to reach that, 
what do we have to do? We have to do sadhana bhakti. And sadhana bhakti has been described in our scriptures very precisely. Lakshanam bhakti yogasya nirgunasya hyudahritam ahaitukya vyavahita ya bhakti purushot Bhagavatam. In this verse, the Bhagavatam tells three qualities of true sadhana bhakti. Rup Goswami in his Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu mentions a very similar thing. Anya bhilashita shunyam jnana karmadhyana vritam and Naraji in his Narad Bhakti Darshan also tells the same thing. Guna Rahitam, Kamana Rahitam, Pratikshana Vardhamanam, Avichinnam, Sukhmataram, Anubhava Rupam. So, what actually in these verses, four main things are mentioned. Conditions of real sadhana bhakti. So the first one mentioned in Bhagavatam is nirgunasya and mentioned by Rup Goswami as anya bhilashita shunyam. It means no other desire, only one desire for God. Ahaitukam means being selfless in your devotion to God. Avyavahit means jnana karmadya navritam, that bhakti is independent and shouldn't have any overbearing addition of karma, jnana, yoga, tapascharya, any other practice. And anukulyena krishnanu shilanam, we should worship Krishna with positive feelings of attachment, developing a, a relationship with him. So we'll look at these four qualities and understand really specifically how do we apply that or how does that change the way we think about bhakti. Take number one. Kamana rahitam, according to Naradji. Anya abhilasha. Shunyam, according to Rup Goswami. It means just desiring God. And when we do devotion to God, not asking Him for any other thing. This is a big one. See, any other thing, what does it mean? It means other than God, what's left? What's left? Four things. Dharma, Arth, Kam, Moksha. I told you yesterday. Or you can say Sattvic desires, Rajas desires, Tamas desires, and the desire for liberation. These four things include everything else other than God. Someone may say, uh, no, I only want to give up the desire for three things. Okay? Take the same four things and make them into three. The desire for happiness in this world, the desire for happiness in Swarg, or the desire for liberation. Three things. Someone may say, no, I only want to give up two things. Okay, take the same three things and make it into two things. Bhukti and Mukti. Mukti, liberation, and bhukti means everything from this world up to the topmost abode of swarg. That's the whole field of bhukti. Now, out of those two, bhukti and mukti, mukti is the more dangerous one, as I told you yesterday, because if you get mukti, you merge into formless God forever, and then you'll never get a chance to attain divine bhakti. So leaving aside mukti, in fact, how many people truly desire for mukti anyway? <laughs> Even if we took a poll of people in the world and explained to them, what is bhukti, what is mukti? 
bhukti meaning uh, enjoyments of this world or enjoyments of the celestial abodes and mukti meaning liberation from any experience at all never suffering again but never experiencing anything if you just walked up to any person on the street and asked him do you want that kind of liberation or do you want enjoyments of the world almost everybody is going to choose bhukti and most, for most people, mukti is like a very distant thing. Okay, is it even possible? They might be wondering. But everybody desires for bhukti. Now, bhukti is less dangerous than mukti because bhukti keeps you in the cycle of birth and death under maya. And it means that there's always a chance you're going to meet a true saint and through the grace of that saint, end up setting your sights on bhakti, divine bhakti, and then you could attain that. So from that point of view, bhakti is better than mukti. Yet, bhakti is still a badhak tattva for the devotee practicing sadhana bhakti. Now, what I mean, understand specifically, because on the path of bhakti, you are not required to renounce before you start. I explain that everyone is qualified for bhakti, no matter how attached they are in this world. So don't ever think that, oh, I'm such a worldly person, I have so many desires, I can't do bhakti. No, you can't. Everybody can do bhakti. What I mean specifically is that when you're doing bhakti, don't ask God for bhakti or mukti, but we're leaving mukti aside. Don't ask him for bhakti. That's what it means. Your mind is still going to be attracted to the world. That is just the nature of the mayic mind. Leave that part aside. The thing is that the great majority of people who do devotion to God do ask God for worldly things. Now, is this a bad thing? Well, on one hand, no. I mean, at least the person is thinking of God. Then why do our scriptures tell us not to ask God for worldly things? Like in Vedas, it's written, Upasate purusham ye hyakama. Do upasana to God without any desire or demand from Him. Upasana means upasana, two words combined, which literally means to go close to God. Asan means to sit, and up means with him or close to him. So what has to go to God? Your mind, your heart has to go to God. That's upasana. If your heart is going to God, you're doing upasana. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ji says, Nadhanam, Najanam, Nasundarim kavitamba jagadish kamaye mama jan mani jan mani shvare bhavatad bhakti rahai tuki tvai. He's asking for something from God, from Krishna. What does he ask for? Ahai tuki bhakti. He says, give me devotion to your lotus feet, which is selfless. I don't want anything from you. Nadhanam, I don't want wealth. Najanam, I'm not asking you for a big family or people to like me. Nasundarim, I'm not asking you for a beautiful wife. Nakavitamva, I don't want to be famous as a writer or a poet. I just want selfless devotion to your lotus feet. Janmani, Janmani, in every birth. See, he's not asking for liberation. He says, I'm fine to be born in this world. You can make me be born in this world in any species, but on the condition that you give me bhakti 
selfless bhakti in my heart. So why do the scriptures and saints say not to ask God for worldly things? Number one, if it's the mind that has to go to God, then think about it. What have you set as your goal if you're asking God for a worldly thing? Whatever it may be, something for you personally or something for one of your children or your family or whatever it is. What is really in our heart at that time that we're asking God for that thing? Is God in our heart? No, that thing is in our heart. So are we doing upasana of God? No, we're doing upasana of the world. Take an example. Let's say you live out in the country somewhere where there's no hospital, but there's a country doctor and maybe your child is ill one night with a very high fever. So you go in the middle of the night to the doctor's house to wake him up because he wasn't answering his phone. And you knock on his door and after a couple of minutes, he comes looking bleary eyed because you just woke him up. And he says, what, what is it? And you explain to him that your child is seriously ill. Please come, please come and Look after him. And the doctor says, no, 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 I don't make house calls in the middle of the night. I'll come and see him in the morning. And you fall at his feet. You're clutching the doctor's feet, crying tears. Are you doing bhakti of the doctor? Someone who just happened along, to them it might look like, oh, this person has so much love for the doctor. Look, he's fallen at his feet. He's crying tears for the doctor. No, his bhakti is for his son. Those tears are for his son, not for the doctor. So when we ask God for any worldly thing, we are doing bhakti of the world, not of God, because we've got the world in our heart, not God. Then someone could ask us the question, have you not even realized yet that where is true happiness? Have you not understood that much? And we'd say, well, what do you mean? Well, is happiness in the world or is it in God? Oh, no, no, no. All the scriptures say happiness is in God. And the happiness of the world is just elusive, temporary. But it seems by the way that you're practicing bhakti that you've made the world your aim. In fact, you're asking God for the world. You know real happiness is in God, not in the world. So when you pray to God, what are you asking for? The world. It makes about as much sense as if you walk into a market and there's a really good mitai ki dukan with all the best sweets. And you walk up to the shop owner and you say, uh, I want to buy some chappal. I want to buy some uh, sandals. Can you show me what the selection is? So that shop owner might think, well, maybe, you know, maybe where he's from, chappal means something else. Maybe it's a kind of sweet where he's from. So, uh, um, you know, can you see here that all we have are these sweets? And is any of these called chappal where you come from? He says, no, no, no. He takes off his chappal and he shows it to him. No, 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 this is what I want, one of these. The shop owner will think he's crazy. I'm selling sweets and you're asking me for chappal. Similarly, God himself is the very form of perfect happiness and we go to him and we ask him for this world, which you could say is basically the form of unhappiness compared to God. It doesn't make sense. So it shows when we pray to God and we ask him for worldly things, we haven't even understood what our goal is yet. Then how are we going to practice sadhana? If we're practicing any spiritual path, we, have, we should have a goal fixed in mind first, right? Why are we doing this? So those of you who have heard my whole series of lectures, you know 
that our goal is perfect happiness, which can only be attained through God realization. So although it might be difficult for me to explain this to someone who hasn't heard the whole series, but those of you who have been here every day, this should be an easy logical step for you to make now. That yes, when the goal is God realization, then why would I do bhakti to God and ask him for worldly things? It means that I haven't even set my sights on the real target yet. So then how am I going to be successful? Number two, we all have a destiny. We all have the ability as human beings to perform free will actions but we also have our prarabdh. Karmanan sanchita dhinam jivo dhinas tathapi svatantra kriyamane vai krito bhagavata vida. A saint says that you do have svatantrata, independence, to think say and do whatever you want. That's your free will. As a human being, you have that right. But you also have performed uncountable such free will actions in your uncountable past lifetimes, and you are not free to choose whether you undergo the consequences of those or not. You are free to perform the actions. You are not free to choose to undergo the consequences. You must. Avashyameva bhoktavyam kritam karma shubha shubham. In the Mahabharata, Veda Vyasji writes that avashyameva bhoktavyam. Everyone must undergo the consequences of their previous actions. Na bhuktam chiyate karma kalpa koti shatairapi. Mahabharata. Again, he says, even a jnani, a liberated jnani who is still in his body, but he surrendered to God and got liberation. For the time that he remains on this earth, he still has to undergo his destiny. Can you imagine? <laughs> he's liberated, but for as long as he's on this earth, he still has to undergo the destiny that was written in his name at the time he was born. So if a great jnani Paramahans has to undergo his destiny, then what to say of ordinary people like us? Jnani bhugate jnate murak bhugate roya. The only difference between us and a jnani is the jnani is resigned to his fate. He says whatever is going to happen, good or bad, let it happen. And he's unaffected by it. But murak bhugate roya. Those who don't have that understanding, they are deeply affected by the ups and downs of what happened in their daily life. Hani labh jivan maran yasha ap yasha vidhi hath. So according to this law of karma, you have these uncountable past actions waiting to fructify. And at the time you were born in this life, you were given a part of that, not the whole thing. The whole thing is called your sanchit karma. That's an unlimited stock of past karmas. So out of that unlimited stock, God gave you a small part to undergo in this life. That's called your prarabd karma. And simultaneously, you can do kriyaman karma, which means you're performing new actions every moment with your free will thinking and speaking and doing. But some things that are going to happen to you are going to it's just part of your destiny. So, hani lab. This means your financial state, major financial state, is predetermined by your past life's actions. Winning the lottery is not luck. You earned it by giving a lot of charity in your last life. And being poor in this life is not bad luck. 
you just earned it <laughs> by not giving charity in your past life. That's pretty much how it works. However much we give, that much we get back in the next life. So those situations are predetermined. Hani lab jivan marana yash apayash. Let's skip to yash and apayash. Having a good name or a bad name, being famous or infamous, that's also predetermined. And jivan, the uh, situation that you're born into, and marana. Marana means the actual time of your death is predestined to the second. So these are the very things that we pray to God for, aren't they? We pray to God for money, a better job, a uh, promotion. We pray to God for all of the things that are either determined by our destiny or they're in our hands like someone praying to Saraswati at the last minute to help them pass their exam. Well, it's not a question of Saraswati helping you or not helping you. How much did you study? It's a combination of the intelligence that you were granted as part of your destiny. You know, what kind of a brain did you get? Okay, that's part of it, but then how much hard work did you put in? Now, where does God come into that? God doesn't enter into the picture. Why would, God, why would God interfere? Really? Either you studied or you didn't. <laughs> God doesn't have anything to do with it. So God follows laws as well. Don't think that, oh, God can do anything. We could make a whole book, a big thick book, if we started listing the things that God can't do. Is God all-powerful? Yes, but God follows certain rules. It's not a free-for-all. So God abides by the law of karma. We perform the actions. We have to undergo the consequence. Why would God overturn those laws for us? You see, even in the world, if you want to get a law changed that the worldly government has made, how many months or years does that take to get some new policy instituted or to change an old policy? It takes so long. So uh, you think the laws of the spiritual government would be so easily overturned that, uh, oh God, I want this thing. Is that easy, really? When, look at the divine history. Dasharat was a saint. He was Manu in his last life. He did devotion to God, became God, realized, and he got granted to have Ram as his son in his next life, God himself as his son. Now when Ram went to the jungle and Dasharat died, Ram is God. His own father is dying in his separation. And when he returns from the jungle, he finds out that father has passed away. Did it make a difference that Dasharat's son was God? No, he didn't save him. He didn't change what was planned. Abhimanyu. Think about who Abhimanyu was. His father is Arjun, a God-realized saint. Gita Gyani, Arjun. The, the Purohit who performed his marriage to Uttara was Veda Bhyas, also a dissension of God. And his Mamaji, his maternal uncle, was Sri Krishna, Swayam Bhagwan. So what happens? Abhimanyu is killed through, you know, illegal means on the battlefield. And after it happens, Krishna, Veda Vyas, and Arjun, sab baithe shok manare. God, Swayam Bhagwan Shri Krishna, one of his avatar, Veda Vyas, and Gita Gyani Arjun. The three of them are sitting talking about how sad it is. They couldn't change it. They didn't change it. When it was Abhimanyu's time to go, it was his time to go. And we think that uh, by 
paying some pandit ji to recite maha mrityunjay mantra that our loved one is going to be saved it doesn't make sense now i understand that this is something some people have believed for their whole life and sometimes it's hard to change a belief but that's a sign of intelligence when something is different than what you believe in but it makes more logical sense than what you believe in it's a sign of intelligence to be able to change your belief that's a sign of intelligence and holding on to it in the face of all logic holding on to the old belief that's just stubbornness it's not intelligence so everybody can change their understanding just because we've believed something for our whole life doesn't make it right if something makes sense think about it and internalize it and then adopt that form of bhakti there's a danger in fact to asking god for these worldly things because let's say someone prayed to god and asked for a son now if it was in your destiny you would have gotten the son anyway whether you prayed to god or not but the one who believes that god answers my prayers then they think well i got the son because i prayed to god even though it was a coincidence so their faith goes up for god so you'd say that's a good thing right yeah for that time it's a good thing then let's say their son gets sick they again pray to god maybe they go to vaishnav devi and ask please save my son it was you i prayed to to get the son now don't let him die at such a young age let's say your son gets better because that was not his destined time to die again coincidence you happen to pray to god he would have gotten better no matter what now let's say a couple of years later again he falls ill this time you pray to god to help you he's your only child but it was his time to go and he goes but you don't think that you think that god ignored your prayer i've met so many people who are angry with god because they think when something good happens to them it's because god's smiling on them and when something bad happens to them god is just like you can say randomly making people suffer for no reason so they get angry with god how can we do bhakti with such wavering faith every time something that we want to happen happens to us we say jai ho bhagwan and every time something happens to us that we don't think is just even though it's happening because of our past karmas then we blame god so our faith diminishes or even people become gnostic i've met people who say i don't believe in god why because so and so died so even if god saves so and so how long will they say will he save them how how long do you want them to live i mean do you want him god to save him when that person is 50 years old too and then again pray for their life when god when he's 80 years old and god saves him again and then he's 100 years old pray for him again god's how, how long will he go on saving him everyone has to die at some point so that moment of death is predestined it has nothing to do with praying to god or not praying to god anyway what kind of god would god be if he were that kind of businessman that if you pray to me then i'll do this thing for you i'll favor you in this way and those who don't pray to me well yes you're my children as well but you're not getting my grace so that's not the kind of god anyone wants to believe in it's just that we never thought of it in that way like if um someone prays for someone else A lot of people do that but think about it logically. So many people are suffering in the world. Does God not know that they're suffering? He knows. They're not suffering because he's making them suffer. They're suffering because that's the consequence of their past actions. Now would it be fair if God noticed, "Oh, you're praying for that person because they're suffering?" and this other person is also suffering because they performed a similar action in their past life but no one's praying for them so let them suffer but i'll help this person because someone was praying for them that's not the kind of god i want to believe in 
I want a logical God, okay, who follows certain sensible rules, and God does follow a sensible set of rules, and it goes like this. Every soul is bound to undergo the consequences of their past karma until sarvadharman parityajya maam ekam sharanam braja aham tvam sarvapape bhyo mokshayishyami once you completely surrender to God, then he eliminates all of your sanchit karma. He completely erases it. Then you're free from all of that at the time you become God-realized. So there's two situations. Either we're not God-realized, like all of us, so we're undergoing our karma, past karma, or we are God realized, in which case all of that is burnt. So once we understand this, then we know, oh yes, okay, asking God for worldly things does not make logical sense. When in fact my goal is God realization, why don't I ask God for himself or ask him for his divine vision or his divine bhakti? Now, there's one other point to consider in this, which is that even if God did fulfill our wishes, let's set aside this whole philosophy that God doesn't, get, doesn't grant worldly boons. Even if he did, what would the use of it be? Seriously, what's he going to give us that we haven't already experienced? In uncountable lifetimes, we've been king, we've been queen, we've been president, we've been a movie star, we've been Miss Universe, we've been and done everything. We're still, look where we are today. We're in the very same place we've always been, dissatisfied, looking for more, enjoying somewhat in this world, but wanting more. And then when we pray to God for worldly things, what are we asking him for? More of the same, which has never satisfied us up until now. So why not ask him for that one thing that would satisfy us forever? Him. <laughs> Only when a soul attains him, the soul becomes purnakam, perfectly happy forever. So this uh, asking God is like a bimari. It is. It just goes on because the more you get, the more you have to ask for anyway, right? I mean, when would it ever be enough? You ask God for a million dollars, a week later you'll think of being a billionaire because you'll get bored of being a millionaire. Well, I can't even buy a house in the Hamptons with a million dollars. God, give me a billion dollars. Then I could afford the house in the Hamptons and a helicopter to get out there and back and avoid the traffic. That would be great. Then if he gave you that, then you'd think, no, that's not enough. It'd be great to have one in Hawaii as well. Oh yeah, I hear the weather there is great year round. But then I'd also need a private jet to get to Hawaii and back. So the desires just go on multiplying. Even if God fulfilled our each and every desire, we wouldn't stop asking him. <laughs> Don't think that, okay, God, just grant me this one wish and I'll never ask you for anything ever again. He would grant us that wish and within a week we'd be thinking, of, oh, but how about just one more? <laughs> it's like when you tell your kids to go to bed, just five more minutes, just five more minutes, one more video game. So there are other important reasons as well why we should not ask God for worldly things when we're on the path of bhakti, but I'll be explaining those when we continue tomorrow. 